in this presentation, I'll start with a very brief introduction and then Matt will show all the details in a Jupyter notebook. So I guess most of you are familiar with the particle data group. It provides a comprehensive summary of particle physics and related areas in a single publication, the review of particle physics. And the Python API that I'm presenting today is really about making this data available conveniently via Python. The work of the PDG is done by an international collaboration of now 240 scientific authors from 173 institutions and 25 countries. And the review of particle physics is available in, in many different forms, but notably online at pdg.lbl.gov and more interactively at pdglife.lbl.gov. If you open the review of particle physics, you find three main parts, namely the summary tables, the particle listings, and a set of 120 individual review articles that cover a wide range of topics, pretty much everything of relevance to particle physics. Today, we'll mostly concern with the summary tables and the particle listings. And so if you look at the summary tables, an example is given on, on the left side for the Pion. There you find the PDG world averages or best limits on pretty much all relevant quantities of a given particle. Uh, for, for each quantity, there's just a single number. For example, let's say you're interested in the mass of the pine and want to know where this comes from. Then you can go to the particle listings where you find the detailed information on how PDG arrives at, at a given average or, or limit. And so to make all this data available, PDG has been developing three, three tools that, that come together as, as a sort of a single API. So the first tool is the Python API. That's what we're discussing today. This is a high-level API that provides programmatic access to PDG data from Python, and it comes with a local data store. This local data store is an SQLite database base file, and you can now, independently of the Python API, download such database files from the PDG website. Um, these database files are primarily aimed at software developers who wish to incorporate PDG data into their own software. And, and as I mentioned, this, this is what, what the Python API also uses as, it, as its data store. And then finally, if you look at the page in PDG Live, there's now a JSON button there. And if you click that button, then you get, you, you download it, the JSON data, the data displayed on, on this page in JSON format. This happens via REST API that you can also use directly in your scripts or programs if you wish to do so. This is, however, intended only for incidental and rate-limited use. So what's the status of all this? Most of these things have been available as a beta version for, for almost a year. And with the 2024 edition of the Review of Particle Physics, these tools are now available as a first production release. Currently, you can only access the summary table data, but the listings data should be added within the next couple of months. And so the Python API is implemented as a standard Python package. It supports Python 3, of course, and for now also 2.7. It's installed like any other Python package. It's released as open source software, and I put a link to the GitHub there. And you can find documentation at pdgapi.lbl.gov. Now, before I hand it over to, to Matt for all the details on how to actually use this, there's one more thing we need to talk about, and that's how do we actually refer to a desired particle physics quantity in a program. For some things, this is pretty easy. For example, for the charge pion, you would easily guess the ASCII name, or maybe you remember the Monte Carlo particle number. But how about the branching fraction of the decay B to J psi K star pi plus pi minus? In order to have a convenient way to refer to, to every object you might encounter in particle physics, PDG defines digital object identifiers turn PDG identifiers. And these are basically just case insensitive alphanumeric strings. Typically the first four alphanumeric characters in these strings denote a particle and additional part characters are used for properties. And if it comes in the form of a string dot a number, then it's typically a branching fraction. So for example, the pi plus is denoted by S008, while the above decay would be S042.214. Now, of course, you're not expected to always use these PDG identifiers. And in most cases, you can simply iterate over the quantities of interest. But if a PDG identifier is needed, you can look it up in PDG Live, where it's now displayed next to the, uh, to the JSON button. 
And so that concludes my introduction. And with this, let me stop sharing and hand over to Matt. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we'll hear you fine. Thank you. All right, let me share this window. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a few examples just to illustrate some of the main features. Uh, so the beginning of this notebook is a couple of installation steps, which you can skip over if you're running the notebook from Binder. If you wanna run it locally, just follow these instructions here. Um, in all the notebook cells that follow, we assume that you've run the following preamble, just that you've imported the PDG package as well as your standard Python libraries, in this case, just matplotlib and numpy. And then once you've imported the package, if you want to instantiate the API, you just call this connect function within the PDG module. So we do that right here. And we have our API. Uh, now, before we go into some of the details on the concepts and basic uh, features of the API, I thought it might be good to give an interesting example. Uh, this example demonstrates one of the main new features of the API, which is programmatic access to branching fractions. So in this case, what we're doing is we're getting the K plus, and then we're iterating over all of its exclusive branching fractions. And then for each one of those, if it's an actual measurement, in other words, if it's not a limit, we print it as well as its value. So let's try that. And there we go, a bunch of decays described by their products as well as the corresponding branching fractions. So we'll have some more examples momentarily, uh, but before we get into those, let's go over some of the basic concepts that you'll encounter as you use the API. Uh, so to start with, we'll talk about particles since most of the time you'll probably be getting a particle and then accessing its properties. So to get a particle from the API, you have a few options. Um, you can get a single one, you can get a list of them, and which one you get depends on the name you use. So if you use a name like pi, which refers to multiple particles, in this case, pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero, you should expect to get a list of particles. If you ask for something like the pi plus, you should expect to get a single one. If you are using a name like pi plus that you know corresponds to a unique particle, you can pass that to this get particle by name function. And we get the PDG particle for the pi plus. If you were to uh, supply a generic name like pi to that function, you get an exception since there's no unique match for that. But if you want to get all the particles corresponding to a generic name like pi, there is this similar function get particles by name. You pass pi to that and you get a list of particles minus, zero, and plus. So that's one, one way to get particles by using their names. And in those cases, aliases and shortcuts will automatically be resolved if there are multiple names for a given particle. Uh, so that's one way. Another way is to use the Monte Carlo ID. Uh, in this case, since they always refer to a specific charge states, there's no ambiguity. You'll always get a single PDG particle from this function. So in this case, if we know that 2212 corresponds to the proton, we can get it that way. And then finally, you can use the identifier as you just discussed, uh, if you know what that corresponds to for a given particle. Uh, in this case, uh, you can expect to get not a PDG particle or a basic Python list of PDG particles. Instead, you'll get something called a PDG particle list. The reason for that is that uh, identifier, identifiers can refer to more than just particles. They can refer to masses and other measurements uh, and all these different things you get uh, for identifiers are instances of subclasses of this master PDG data class. Uh, and so for if an identifier refers to a particle, you'll get a PDG particle list, which is a subclass of PDG data. And in this case, it's just a simple wrapper around a list and you can unwrap it by just calling the list function. And there we see that we get all the charged pions. In this case, S008 refers to the charged pions. So those are the three ways you can get particles, by name, by Monte Carlo ID, and by PDG identifier. Now, however you've gotten a particle, once you've gotten it, you can then start interrogating it. Uh, so the simplest things to get from a PDG particle are the quantum numbers. So you can just access those as attributes of the particle, charges, isospins, and so forth. Uh, here, we just have a couple examples. Uh, now, if you want things that have actual measurements like masses, widths, and lifetimes, there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that there may be multiple identifiers and multiple masses or widths or lifetimes for a given particle. They might correspond to different measurement techniques or different theoretical assumptions. 
Um, in some cases, you'll have just one, but that's not always the case. So you can get access to all of these uh, properties by using these masses, widths, and lifetimes methods on PDG particles. So if we go back to the pi plus, we can get a list of its mass properties. In this case, we see that there's just one. We can get a list of its widths. In this case, there aren't any. But lifetimes, on the other hand, does give us one. Um, and for any of these, whether it's a mass, a width, or a lifetime, since these are all subclasses of PDG property, you can call this summary values function on all these things. And that gives you a list of summary table value objects. And these correspond to the actual numbers that you see in the summary table. So if we go back to this mass property, in this case, we're just getting it directly from the API by providing this identifier, but you could also get it from this list here. Here's our mass. We can call summary values on it. And we get in this case, a couple of summary values. Um, corresponding to one of, the, one of them is a fit, the other is an average, as we can see by calling this value, asking for this value type property. Um, so in some cases you might have multiple summary table values corresponding to a single identifier and these usually correspond to different ways of aggregating the measurements out there. Um, so anyway, once you have a summary value, um, you can then ask for its value and the units. Uh, these are encoded in whatever units are appropriate for the value in question. Um, and you can get both the value and the units by accessing the pro corresponding properties. Uh, and you can also get the value in any desired unit by using this get value function. So going back to that first mass summary table value, we can get 139 MeV. And if we want it in JeV, we can just say that and we get this value here. Uh, so that's how you get values. Getting errors is similar. There are errors in both positive and negative directions as well as the uh, average error, and you can specify, again, a system of units as you'd like. Um, now, this is a bit cumbersome. So for convenience, we also uh, supply these mass, width, and lifetime attributes of a PDG particle. Uh, if you ask for one of these, you'll get the best summary value, which is the first one encoded. Uh, and you'll get it in standard units of GeV and seconds, or inverse seconds. Uh, likewise, widths and lifetimes will automatically be interconverted if you ask for one, but the, it's the other that's actually encoded. Um, and I should mention that in so-called pedantic mode, which we'll talk about later, uh, all this automatic business does not occur if there's any ambiguity. There must be a single matching identifier, or a single summary value, and there will be no interconversion. Uh, but we're not in pedantic mode, we're in the normal mode, and in this case, we just ask for these and we get them. Again, in GeV seconds and inverse seconds. Uh, now, I mentioned that you can have multiple mass properties. So just to provide an example of that, let's go to the top quark. In this case, we see that there are three of them. And you can ask for their descriptions to understand what the differences are. We see one is the mass from direct measurements, one is the, direct, uh, one is the mass from cross-section measurements, and one is the pole mass. Uh, and so you can choose which one you want and get the value that way. So we've talked about masses, widths, and lifetimes. Another property that you can access via the API and that we've already seen uh, is a branching fraction. So let's go ahead and get another pi on. Here we go. Uh, and let's ask for all of its branching fractions. And so we get a list here. Um, and as we showed above, you can specifically ask for exclusive or inclusive branching fractions. Uh, in this case, for the pi plus, all the encoded branching fractions are exclusive ones, as we can see by the fact that the list of inclusive branching fractions is empty. So anyway, let's take the first of these exclusive branching fractions, and that will be a PG branching fraction object, another subclass of PG property like masses, widths, and lifetimes. Uh, we can get its description, which is also printed here. Uh, it's just pi plus to mu plus nu mu. And we can get the summary values for that branching fraction itself. In this case, we get one and its value here is 99.9877. Um, and we can go ahead and inspect the products of the decay as well. And that's one of the interesting things that you can do with decays is look at what actually comes out of these decays. So let's get products. And this gives us a list of two PDG decay product objects, one for the muon, one for the neutrino. Uh, and we see that each one has a multiplier of one, meaning only one of them comes out of the decay, it does not correspond to a sub decay. Um, so there's no further decay of this product encoded here. And you get the name as well. And this PDG item is what lets you access the underlying particle, as we'll see in some of the examples that follow. So that was a quick crash course on the basics. And now in the minutes I have remaining, I'll just go over a few more examples. 
Uh, and these should hopefully be a little more interesting. So to start with, let's take all the B0 decays that produces J psi. So we're gonna start by getting our B0. Uh, and then before we start making comparisons against its decay products, we want something we can compare against. And so if we're gonna use names to compare, which is nice and convenient, I uh, will wanna make sure that we compare the canonical names. So we can take the J psi and get its canonical name here by calling this get canonical name function. Uh, and if we were to show the output from that, we'd see that the canonical name for the JPSI is actually JPSI1S. So that's what you'll see as you iterate over decay products, you'll see things with the name of JPSI1S. Or if you take the PDG particle, you ask for its name, you'll get the name JPSI1S. So that's what we wanna compare against. Okay, so now we can once again, start iterating over the branching fractions of the particle, in this case, the B0. Uh, and then for each of those decays, we can then iterate over the decay products for each of those decay products, we can get the item, which again corresponds to the identity of the particle. Uh, and then since some items can actually refer to more generic things like leptons, if you're talking about decay that can produce muons or electrons, you're not distinguishing between them. So not every PDG item necessarily corresponds to a single unambiguous particle. So to make sure that the item does, we can use this has particle property and in this case, if the item has a particle, and if that item's name is the canonical name of the JPSI, then we found what we're looking for. So we can print the description and the branching fraction of that decay as follows. And here we go. We get a list of all the B0 decays that produce JPSIs. As you can see, again, the canonical name here is actually JPSI1S. Uh, we get all of the decay products printed and we get the branching fraction in uh, text form. So there's one example. Uh, now let's go on and plot the masses of all the decay products of the D plus. Uh, so let's start by creating a set since we might encounter a given mass multiple times since there might be multiple decays that produce a given particle, we don't wanna double count. So we'll just throw the masses into a set and then make a histogram later. So we create our set here, we get our particle here. Uh, and then again, we start iterating over all of its decays. Uh, and then for each of those, again, iterating over all, all of its decay products. And if there's no unique particle for that decay product, we skip it. And if that thing is a particle that has a mass entry, an actual measured mass, then we take that mass and we check to make sure that it's not a limit by seeing whether or not it's none. And if it's not, then we have a measured mass as opposed to a mass limit, and we can throw that measured mass into our set. Uh, and finally, we can just use matplotlib to plot a histogram of all those masses. So let's run this one. And after a few seconds, we should get a histogram. And there it is. So these are the masses in GEV of all the unique decay products of the D plus as encoded in the PDG database. And I should mention that these are the direct decay products. So things that are produced by these decay products are not included in this histogram. Okay, finally, let's take a look at historical data and look at how the K plus mass, both its value and its uncertainty has trended over time. Uh, now, if you wanna take a look at data from uh, um, historical editions of the PDG data, then you'll need the larger PDG all database file from the website here. Uh, so you can download that. Uh, and then you can pass that to the pdg.connect PDG function to explicitly specify the SQLite file you wanna use or any other database that's supported by SQL Alchemy. So we instantiate our database there. Uh, we're calling it API all, since it uh, has all the years of the PDG encoded there. Uh, and then we can create lists for the X values, the Y values, and the Y errors that we're gonna plot. We can then iterate over all the additions in the database. Uh, and then for each of those, we'll get the K plus, and we can specify the addition by passing that parameter to the get particle by name function. Uh, and then if that addition of the PDG has a mass entry for the K plus, and if that mass entry is not none, and in other words, it's a measurement and not a limit, we can then append the corresponding data point to our lists. And then once we have all of those, we plot them. So here we go. And there it is, K plus mass and its uncertainty over time. So one last example. Let's look at all the neutrino mixing properties that happen to be in the database at this point in time. Uh, so if you browse PDG Live and look under neutrino mixing properties, you'll see that the PDG identifiers all are under S067. 
Um, so we can go ahead and get S067. In this case, it's a container for all of these individual measurements. Uh, and then we can iterate over all the child identifiers of S067. And if that uh, child has a summary value, um, then we can print it. So let's do that. And there we go. We get the day night asymmetry measured. We get mixing angles, the mass squared splittings, even delta CP. So that's that. And with that, I will just spend a few minutes uh, with some closing remarks. So I mentioned this pedantic mode. Uh, so this is a mode of the API that requires you to be more explicit. Um, and it's recommended for cases where you really do care about what specific type of mass you're considering, for instance. So if we were to get the top mass, uh, we see that it has three masses again. And in normal non-pedantic mode, you can just say top dot mass, and you'll get this first value here. On the other hand, if you take a pedantic instance of the API and try to do the same thing, you will get an exception, which will tell you that you need to be more explicit. So when you want to be more explicit, you can do it by getting directly the um, mass property. So in this case, Q007TP is the one corresponding to direct measurements. You can get that. You can get its best summary value and get the value for that particular one. And so that's what you'd want to do if you wanted to be more precise and use the API in pedantic mode. So with that, I will wrap up. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions now. OK, great. Uh, that was also basically perfectly on time. So thanks very much. Uh, OK, let's go to the audience for questions. Uh, let's see, I don't think I see any hands raised at the, oh, oh we have a question from Jim. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, first I was going to ask about, um, well, I'm, I'm still going to ask about the relationship between PDG and uh, Particle, uh, the Particle library, um, although I've seen here that, um, that this includes quite a bit more, like all the different editions of the PDG, that's not something in, in Particle. But is there any um, uh, way to synchronize between the two? Because for years, we've I've, I've been pointing uh, users who want this kind of information to the particle library. Yes, the plan is to have better integration with the particle library and the rest of the scikit-hep ecosystem um, over time. Uh, since this is the first time a lot of internal PG information has been available programmatically, uh, this was developed internally, but now that we've gotten this off the ground, we would like to integrate better with the rest of the ecosystem. Okay, thanks. Uh, Henry? Yeah, <clears throat> I was just wondering as a first, maybe as a first thing that could be done, this looks like it's backed by an SQLite uh, database that I assume is produced at some it has a version and has a year on it. Um, maybe a first step would be particle could just read this in rather than reading the old output that it was the old text output that it um, particle table. Um, is is this something that's considered fair? The this SQLite database is this considered fairly stable? Like, is it some is it something that um, is not likely to change dramatically over? You know, year over year? Yeah, so the SQLite file is intended for users to use if they'd like, if they'd like to use it directly. So we do intend to support a stable schema. Uh, that's not to say it won't change um, to some extent as we continue to improve things, but mm -hmm. we do intend to make it available for others to use. And so it could conceivably be used as the back end for particle. Okay, because it could, it could like save this the way that it does the current table. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Eduardo can go, and then I might have one more question. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks very much for the presentation. Cool, very cool. Yeah, yeah, there, there's there's a lot to be said on on these things. The integration is really welcome. It's, it's more a matter of time, but I think I can finally say that we'll have more time for this for this business properly. Uh, so we'll be in touch for sure. Uh, the, yeah, the, there are also a few other details. Maybe not not necessarily the the, the, the uh, direct con um, picking up the database for might be easier at the beginning. Uh, to actually pick pick up the, the usual text file, one one reason being that particle actually provides a bunch of things for for particles that are not that are known within the scheme, let's say, but are not 
there, there's no measurement for it. So they're not in the PEG because the PEG is about, is about physics measurements and, and data, whereas, whereas particle can, can, can contain, for example, uh, Susie particles and even more exotic stuff in there with, with their properties and so on. So there's, there's a bit of massaging that needs to be done in there and to be, to be okay, and we need to be careful. I also think that we, we should discuss also some, uh, some uh, harmonization of, of the API. I would have a few, few suggestions maybe, but this is all to be discussed. And the other point to tell, which I also mentioned, uh, is that uh, you, you provide, of course, the, all, all of this decay information, with, with, which is amazing. And especially for flavor physics, where we have these CVT gen decay files, uh, this is fantastic. And that, that will also be an interesting work to be done to synchronize all of these things with what we have, for example, in, in decay language that does these deck files and then you could you could you could do uh, certain exercises very useful for analysts by the pg with some of the things from from the k language actually and you a uh, new met actually showed something when you're talking about the uh, oh let's pick up uh, a busy with decay with the jpsi there's there's other there are other examples that i would i would uh, propose for, for things that are very useful for an expert exactly for an experimentalist and this is again a place where we could really use the the PG uh, uh, library. So I, I think that's really very interesting too. That uh, I totally understand that you you, you work this in in house, and it's great really great to see it out. And and now we can uh, we can discuss a bit more ac across uh, say say uh, um, people and packages. So yeah, thanks also for the interest and in the openness in in, in uh, and willingness to collaborate. I look forward to that. We look forward to collaborating too. Uh, okay, so maybe it looks like we have one more question from Henry and then I think we're probably, unless we have any others, we are probably at time then. So Henry. <clears throat> so I was wondering how, how does this handle um, changes over time? Like if you want to the uh, 2024 data and it's for a long running analysis and you don't want it to update, um, is the data stored in the package or is it pulling it from PDG live? And when, um, mm -hmm. sorry, keep, sorry, go ahead. And is there some way to set, you know, request older versions? Yes. When you install the package using pip, uh, the SQLite file corresponding to the latest edition will be downloaded. Um, however, you can go to the PDG website and download SQLite files for previous editions uh, and specify those when you call this api.connect function. You can also download the PDG all SQLite file that has all historical editions and then uh, instantiate your, uh, uh, you can request the, you can specify the year when you request anything from the, from the API, like a particle or specific measurement. So you can either plug in a specific version of the database, or you can specify the year that you want when making API calls. Either of those methods are supported. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, so I don't think I see any other additional hands. Uh, so I'll just uh, close by saying that, uh, yeah, I think this is great to see and having, um, you know, programmatic access to the full PDG is a, a quite a special thing. So uh, very, very glad to see this. Oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe we can slip in one more comment from Jim and then we can close. I just wanted to make sure that you're on Slack so we can follow up because I wanted to know about the versioning. I want to make sure that uh, analyses are reproducible. You know, normally we, we uh, yes <laughs> the uh, the um, package version numbers, and so if the database is decoupled from that, that could be a problem. So, uh, are you on Slack? Uh, I'll have to probably email you because I'm on multiple Slacks, but probably not the Slack that you're talking about. Yeah, the one for this I have. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not. So I will uh, look into getting onto that. <laughs> Yeah, the join link should be in the the emails that have gone out. Uh, okay. But yeah, that would be great to follow up. Okay, we'll do. Yeah.